Amen. What a joy it is to be in God's house on this Easter Sunday. Now, you have probably already done this multiplied times, but just in case, just tell somebody, Happy Easter. Happy Resurrection Day. Come on, let's not get confused what we're celebrating. I didn't say hoppy Easter. I said happy Easter. It's a good day to celebrate the goodness of the Lord and our resurrection of our Savior. Because his resurrection speaks to the new life that we have found in him. I turn your attention to John chapter 20. And as you're turning there, I say a great big thank you to all those who have served so wonderfully in preparing for this service behind the scenes and in front of the scenes. We honor you. Thank you, worship team, choir, the Sunday school teachers, our leaders and our children's ministries and our other ministries that are working so hard around the building today so that you can enjoy your time here in the main sanctuary as well. Looking to John chapter 20, I remind us that no matter if they try to take the Bibles out of the stores and replace them with eggs and baskets, and no matter what the political agenda tries to relabel today, today is the day that we celebrate that the tomb is empty and Jesus Christ lives. Come on, don't be confused by what's happening. He told them, you'll be hated for my name's sake. But all it does is makes me want to shout the louder that Jesus Christ is alive and well and he's changing lives. He's changing lives. John 20 and verse 11. To visitors, if I haven't had the chance to meet you personally, I just want to say thank you for being with us here today. We bless you and hope that you feel at home at Calvary Tabernacle. But Mary stood, verse 11 says, without at the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher. She's looking for the body of Jesus. And seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Everybody say had lain. And they said unto her, Woman, Why weepest thou? And she saith unto them, Because they have taken away the Lord, and I do not know where they've laid him. And when she had turned thus, said, she turned herself back, and she saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. You ever see somebody in your peripheral vision? They're there, but you don't really know who it is. They're there, but... Jesus saith unto her, woman, why weepest thou? Who are you looking for? Whom seekest thou? She supposing him to be the gardener. I love that line. Supposing him. It's amazing to me that she thought the true vine was the gardener. Saith unto him, sir, if thou have borne him hence, if you've moved him, tell me where you've taken him. Where have you laid him? And I will take him away. And Jesus saith unto her, Mary. And here's how I know she saw him but didn't look at him. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. I've come to preach a very simple but a very clear word today. You can be in his presence and not recognize him. But he has showed up today so that everybody who will listen will know he's not just shown up. He's shown up for you. You showed up for Easter. Well, guess what? He showed up to touch you. Would you pray a simple prayer with me right now? Would you lift your hands and would you pray, Lord, let me hear you call my name? Come on, pray that way right now. You might have just come to appease a friend or a family member or 
when you choose a church at Easter, this is the one you come to, and we're glad. But would you pray, Lord, let me hear your voice. God, I pray you'd help me to preach with wisdom and clarity here today. Help me to articulate the word as I feel it. That it might make sense and bless this body that has gathered here today. We ask it in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And let everybody say he's alive. You may be seated here today. It was in 2007 that this social experiment took place. Don't worry, the footage is just from a security camera. It's not ominous. It's captured so that we could watch what's happening here. The gentleman who is playing is named Joshua Bell. He is regarded as a master violinist. But as you watch the individuals walking through that D.C. metro, they hurried about their business. What's the point to see? But in this D.C. metro, because they thought he was just a random person, they gave him no time nor attention. The D.C. metro is what they did every day for most of them. And they didn't have time in this regular part of their life to stop and take notice of someone who had shown up for them. I would tell you here today, there was a much more important miss that's in our opening text. In John chapter 20, when Mary shows up, having had herself an incredible spiritual experience, she's there because she loves Jesus for what he has done in her life. She recognizes what he took out of her, the demonic oppression that had been earlier in her life and in her years. He had eradicated that which desired to destroy her. And now upon his death, she shows up. And ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you that she was very confused about the power of the resurrection, and we should not fault her for that. For even the disciples up until this very point are still confused about the actual resurrection. They are still confused that Jesus Christ in his concerning the temple being destroyed and raised up had struggled to fathom that his body would in fact get up out of that grave and death could not hold him down. And so Mary does not recognize him that day when she is there at the sepulcher. And I submit to you my first point here. When you show up looking for death, it is hard to see life. And we are currently living in a world where every morning's news line and headline has us expecting it will be another day of national negativity. That there is death and despair on the horizon. And that is why I believe we live in a world right now so saturated with darkness. It is hard for people to think that in the midst of all the death that there can be life. But I believe that we hold the single greatest answer all humanity has ever known. That there is an answer greater than every form of trying to appease the flesh. Every other prescribed or adopted way of trying to find peace. There is an answer and that answer's name is Jesus. I recognize our social climate, and I recognize our political climate, and I know that some, maybe even online, will be against what I'm about to say, but changing who you are in the natural or in the flesh can never bring peace that having a spiritual change can bring you. There is a resurrected Savior 
And even if you woke up today thinking that negativity is all you would find, Mary, I know you woke up today thinking I want to get to the sepulcher early because I want to show my love on his death. But there is a risen Savior whose body no longer needs to be anointed. In fact, he has risen that he might go from you anointing him to him anointing you. And I'm not sure what problem you walked in with on this Easter morning. I'm not sure if your parents have been fighting or your mind has been overwhelmed or your health has been on the ropes. But I do know this, because he lives, because the grave is empty, there is an opportunity to turn your attention from the dead things of life and get it on the goodness of a risen Savior. I I wonder if anybody in this room that's a believer would say there was a time when I was focusing on the negative, but he picked me up and he turned me around. And when I got my eyes on the fact that the tomb is empty and I don't have empty promises, I have an empty tomb. And because he lives, I'm able to put a smile on my face and get a little joy in my spirit. That's why born-again believers ought to wear a smile on their face. Knowing the tomb is empty ought to put a... Come on, it ought to put a smile on your face and a song in your spirit. The fact that he brought me out of the miry clay, he put my feet on the rock to stay, it ought to bring you in on an Easter. Listen, I understand Easter has become all about Easter baskets and bunnies and all that hopping around. I'm going to tell you what it's really about. Walking in here on a Sunday and saying, he's the one that got up so I can get up to. I'm able to live resurrected because he resurrected. I'm able to be a new person, not by myself, but in Christ Jesus. Come on, behold, all things are passed away. All things are become new. How many believe every person can experience the resurrection? Every person. Elbow your neighbor and tell them, even you. Look back at him and tell him, don't elbow me just because he says it. Don't elbow. <laughs> She showed up expecting death so she could not recognize life. Not at this point. And I'm going to tell you she's spiritual. She's spiritual at this point. How do you know? She's having a conversation with angels. I don't care if you can talk to the angels if you don't recognize Jesus. Come on, we have a world right now with all that it's after. It's after all kinds of spiritual things and all kinds of, can I preach it how I feel it? Clamber and after cards and gyms and rocks and got people telling us they dance with angels but don't know Jesus. It's a problem. It's a problem because it doesn't matter how spiritual you are until you come to a recognition that there's only one who can say your name and change your life and take you from the very pit of your despair and the turmoil of your of your tragic situation. It doesn't matter if you speak to the angels if you don't know Jesus, but all he had to do was say her name. She thought he was the gardener until he said her name. And when he said her name, there was something that shot through every fiber of her being. And she turned around and she didn't say gardener anymore. And she said, Master Rabboni. Because when he called her name, something surged through her. He's not dead. He's not dead. He's not in the tomb. I wonder if anybody here remembers when he called your name. Do you remember when he said, I got plans for you. I got, come on, I got something I want to do through your life. You don't have to be lost. You don't have to be undone. You don't have to live in despair. Pastor Oliver, when he called her name. That's good, Pastor, but he don't know who I am. Wrong. The Bible says he knows you so much, he even knows how much hair you wore in here today. <laughs> or the <laughs> Come on, for some of us, it's easier to count than others. <laughs> but he 
knows. And if he knows the number of hairs on your head, he knows the situation you've been battling. He knows the family trauma you're going through. He knows the addiction you haven't been able to shake. He knows the situation in your life you think no one knows about. And even though it looks like the grave is overwhelming and the situation is devastating, I promise you, and I've got nearly a thousand people that'll bear witness to this right now. If you could just hear him call your name, everything can change in one moment, one instant, just hear him call your name. Listen, I want to move on, but I can't yet. I want everybody, this is going to be our own little social experiment. Okay, on the count of three, I want everybody to scream your own first name as loud as you can. Now, you're not trying to win a competition here, but some of you don't know anything other than that, so we'll see how this goes. Your own first name, I want you to yell it as loud as you can. One, two, three. At three, one, okay. Let's do it one more time. That was pretty awesome. I want to see if we can get about twice that loud. One, two, three. Now that was massive confusion. There's no, no way I could pick up somebody in this section over here and have them stand up and grab somebody from this section and say, now when we yelled, what did they say? Because if you don't know them already, you'd have no idea. But you need to know that in the billions of people on this planet, When you walked in, even though hell might have been convincing you your life is over, when you walked in, you were in the divine design of God. He saw you walked in because you were fearfully and wonderfully made. And when you walked in this place, he was wanting you to hear what I was going to tell you today. As sure as you know your name, he knows your name. And it's not because your father or your mother gave it to you. Whether you were raised by your biological parents or grandparents or you grew up in the home of somebody else, whether you grew up feeling loved or grew up feeling abandoned, I want everybody in the place to know that you have a father that knows your name and he knows exactly where you're at. He is not overwhelmed by your situation and you don't have to be in him. Pastor, listen, you, I know what you're trying to do here. It's Easter, I get it. We got a big crowd, but we only came here so that mom would leave us alone. No problem. She didn't show up wanting this conversation either. Pastor, I, I, listen, you're great and stuff. That's fine. You, you, you yell a little too much and you get sweaty too much. It's weird. But, but I, I, I showed up because I knew if I came today that they would buy me lunch. I only came today because a friend invited me, and they keep inviting me. And I figured if I showed up today, listen, she had no intention on this conversation, maybe any more than you did, but I am on an assignment from heaven to tell somebody in this room today, he knows your name, and if you will hear him call your name, if you will let... If you'll feel it in the recesses of your spirit, it'll do something to you because when you know he calls you, you will not stay the way you are. I'm convinced you can't really hear him and stay put. You gotta be some kind of disobedient. How many know that when you've been raised by somebody, there's this ability to hear and know a voice? Pastor Oliver and I were talking the other day and talking about this, this message, in fact, and we got to speaking through the dynamics of knowing a voice and hearing your name call. He began to share a very open story, and I asked him, I said, do you care if I share that with the congregation? He was kind enough to oblige. Were you 16 when your mom passed away? He was only 16 years old. Boy, I felt a big ache in my heart when you started to tell the story. But he said they had had some old videos turned into a, you know, how many know that there's been a progression in video? <laughs> this digitizing, this bringing it along. Anybody in here ever enjoy watching those old home videos that your parents pulled out, pulled out to torture you? Anybody? 
wasn't too long ago. He was 16 years old when he lost his mother. It wasn't too long ago. They had digitized and taken some of those home videos. He said he was walking through the, walking through the house, walking through the room, not, not ready, but all of a sudden from that old video he heard, Daddy! He said, and it was the voice of my mom from when I was a kid. Felt 16 again, didn't he? He said, I know that voice anywhere. But it's not just that voice. It's the way that voice said my name. I submit to you here today. He can say your name like nobody can say it. Here's what I need. I need somebody that was lost, but you remember when he called your name. I need some, you remember, you remember I was lost. I was living, I was showing up to a tomb expecting to see death, but I heard him. He called my name and it's changed. If that's you today, I need you to just maybe stand and throw your hands towards heaven and bear witness to some people. I remember when he called. I don't know if it was on a campground or in this very church. I, I don't know if it was in a youth service or if it was at a youth congress. I don't know. I don't know where it was. I, I, you might have been driving down 65 and all of a sudden a song came on and in the middle of that song a thundering voice from heaven. Nobody else heard it but you heard it and he called your name. And I conclude I conclude with this, stand with me in the house because the Bible says when he called her name, Mary, the Bible says she turned herself. He was the prophetic promise of the Old Testament. He was the creator of Genesis. The Lamb of Leviticus. The great exeter of Exodus. I can walk you through every book and tell you that God was made flesh. Isaiah said, he will be born and the government shall be. And since the beginning of time, he had been doing his part. Because he always does his part. He had, he had lived. He had been born of a virgin. He had stayed in obscurity for the first 12. Has a brief time in the temple and then goes back into obscurity for 18 more years. He had done his part. He walked among us. He healed the sick and the lame. He allowed the eyes to be opened and the ears to be unstopped. He, he did all things. In fact, he gave us a name recognition before in John chapter 11 when he stepped to the edge of Lazarus' tomb and called him by name. And that dead body got up out of the grave and walked to him. Because when he calls your name, even if you're dead, even if you walked in this place and feel like you got the bandages on you, and like Lazarus, you feel like you've been in the grave four days, and my, his body stunk, but my life stinks, I'm telling you. All he's got to do is call your name. And then he would suffer and he would bleed and he would die with a host of angels ready to intercede on his behalf. He would gather in the garden and say, not my will, but thy will be done. And he would sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. And he would allow Simon to be selected to help carry the cross beam. He, he would allow himself to hang on that cross until he would ultimately, he would give up the ghost. In his silence of the first 12 years, he had been developing in the silence of those second 18, he was developing. But some of his greatest silent work was not done in those first 12 or those second 18 years. Some of the greatest work of silence he ever did was on the day between the cross and the resurrection when he went ahead and took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. So that when he called your name, he could prove he's already got the keys to the door you're locked behind. The situation. He did.
did it all, all the way up until that Sunday morning when she was running to the tomb, but he was awake and he had dispatched angels and they were setting one at the head and one at the foot. They were there because he had perfectly and precisely planned it all. It was according to the will of God. He is not dead. How did he do all that? Because he did his part all the way up until this when he said, Mary. Because in that moment of turmoil, he was the only one who could change her mind. But since he did all that and did his part, the least she could do was turn and do hers. To every person under the sound of my voice, I'm telling you, your walk with God has to be bigger than an Easter Sunday. I promise you, listen, I I need you to hear me, and I believe in plans and programs, and if you know me, I support it. I believe in you doing everything you can to seek help and to be accountable, but what you won't ever find on a couch and what you can't ever find in a pill or a bottle, you can find in a person. It is in a person. It is in the person of Christ who was fully God and fully man, and I know you might have just shown up today so that they would know you came. You you love them, and I'm glad you love them, and I'm glad you came, whether a regular member or maybe you're a guest here today. I'm glad you love them, but I need you to hear he loves you. That's good, Pastor, but what do I have to do? Don't tell me i got to run down to that front. I'm not doing that. No, no, no. Here's the thing. All Mary had to do was turn to him. Every person in every pew across this building I'm going to ask you to entertain the presence of God for a moment. And if you're willing right where you're at, I would ask you to turn to him. I might even ask you, would you lift your hands? The Bible says we lift up holy hands. It is our sign of surrender. I don't want to be like those people walking through the D.C. metro where the great violinist is playing and they don't recognize who it is. I I don't want to be in the presence of Jesus Christ. And let's not take a little time to say, Jesus, I recognize you. Now, not everybody might want to, but there are some who would. While we're praying across this building, there are some who would like to slip out of your pew and walk down to this front area and begin to join me and begin to pray with me that we would have a turning in our city, that we would have a turning in our families. Pastor, you can't really believe that can happen. Yes, I can. Yes, I do. What's your prayer? I'll tell you what I've been praying for this service. God, let somebody hear you call their name. Let them turn from the way they're self-medicating. Let them turn from the way they're trying to deal with pain. Let them turn from the depression. Let them turn from the anxiety. Let them turn from the bitterness. Let them turn from the strife. Let them turn from whatever they're dealing with. In fact, you might have even walked in and said, my life's going pretty good, but you know, the tomb has got a body in it and it brings a little hurt. And I've come to tell you the tomb is empty so your heart can be full. They're going to sing and we're going to pray. I want us to pray at the altar and I want us to pray in the pews. Be a good time if you have someone near you and they're comfortable that you even link up and pray with them. God, let their heart be full. Let their family be blessed. Let their spirit be strengthened. He's alive. So your dreams can be alive. He's alive, so your family plans can be alive. Come on, let's call on the name of the Lord. I'm asking every member, lift your hands. Lift your voice. We do not want a resurrection without recognition. Come on, we want that resurrection to be alive and well in this house today.